Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with New York City-based jazz vibraphonist and composer Chris Dingman. He opened up about his new 2020 CD, Embrace. It's a great one. This cat is known for his distinctive approach to the instrument, sonically rich and conceptually expansive, bringing listeners on a journey to a beautiful, transcendent place. Originally from San Jose, California, piano and percussion were his first instruments early on. He came to New York in 2007, and along with a host of great names, he has done significant work with legendary artists like Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter. He keeps up a busy performance schedule with numerous tours across Western Europe, Canada, and the United States, and a rigorous performing and recording schedule in New York City. He is also an active educator, working with students of all ages and levels for the past 15 years. So please get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. So thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today, man. I appreciate it. Happy to do it. So I love the album Embrace, and I want to know from you, what was your artistic vision with this project? It came together kind of piecemeal at first. It came out of a a desire to embrace more fully my role as a vibraphonist and kind of have that be the lead voice of an album. And uh, how I came to the music was a process of just exploring what makes me tick a little more, what what motivates me to play music, and what came out of it was some new approaches to the vibes and uh, in, an embrace of more influences of different kinds of music. So there's a pretty heavy strain of influence of uh, music from the country Mali and West African Monday music of the um, uh, people like Tumani Diabate and Umu Sangre and Ali Farka Toure. And then, of course, um, I'm heavily influenced by all my upbringing in jazz, too, so it's all kind of combined. You grew up in San Jose. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you got involved with music and jazz and kind of what were some early influences for you. Yeah, wow. Well, I grew up in San Jose, and I was mainly playing piano and drums. And I got into jazz. I was the first time I heard vibraphone was I was probably twelve, but I didn't ever think that that was something I could play. Uh, no one had a vibraphone, <laughs> and so uh, even in high school, I was playing drums a lot. And uh, there was a great drummer in the Bay Area who's still there and still active named Wally Schnally, who was really inspirational. And uh, I got into playing jazz as a drummer. And then when I went to college, um, I played a little bit of mallets like in high school band, but when I went to college, I studied with Jay Hogard, who's a great vibraphonist at Wesleyan University, and he got me into vibes. He, was, he I walked into his office before classes even started freshman year, and he asked me, hey, have you ever played Vibes? And I said, well, I've touched it a little bit. And he, and he said, you're going to play Vibes. And he was right. I <laughs> got into yeah. it over the, over the course of uh, college. So the rest, I guess, is uh, me as a vibraphonist. So, there on. yeah, so was your, did you always have a dream of becoming a professional musician or were there other things that were on your radar i was always strongly drawn to music there's like photos of me as a baby playing piano <laughs> and uh and i have a lot of strong memories of of music as a, as a very young kid but as i was growing up i didn't necessarily go to like a conservatory i didn't i wasn't sort of groomed in the you know more traditional ways uh at first, um, so I was considering other options, and then realized actually when I uh, right around when I turned 20, realized that music was the path for me. And uh, I was actually in India at the time studying music, studying Indian music, and um, I got a call from my parents saying that a close childhood friend had passed away, and it was like a real revelatory kind of time period uh, that was really sad and then also very revealing of what I 
what I really wanted to do with my life. And so that was sort of when I came forward. And then eventually ended up, went up, ended up going on to the Monk Institute, Polonius Monk Institute, now called the Herbie Hancock Institute. Studied more formally with a lot of jazz musicians during that time. You did study with Terrence Blanchard, Ron Carter, Benny Golson. There was a lot of people. What, have the, yeah. what did you learn from people that are legends and luminaries in the world of jazz? What did they give you? Oh, man. So much. <laughs> How could I? It'd be hard to quantify in one short short answer, but um, the sense that, you know, to follow your own dreams, I think, is a big one that a lot of people, you know, presented, like everyone presented kind of their own artistic path, but ultimately encouraged us to, to find our own. And, of course, with, with a lot of sense of the history of the music and, you know, going through that into your own path. But uh, especially Terrence Blanchard was really, uh, if he was artistic director of the Institute, he he was always finding different ways to frame the, the whole uh, artistic process. And uh, he was really good at kind of teasing that out of us. As a, you know, especially compositionally, um, and in all kinds of ways. So I spent a lot of time with him um, talking. He often would talk kind of philosophically about things, and that that had a big influence on me, um, especially in the sense of uh, using music to tell a story or to convey something that's kind of extra musical about your life or about the world or something that's going on. So that was a big, big part of that. And I'd, I'd say the the older generation, people like Ron and Jimmy Heath and Benny Golson, they were just also encouraging and also held everyone to such a high standard of, you know, they really care about the music just being at a high level. So that was something that was instilled a lot. So you arrived in New York in 07. You've done a lot of work with Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter and a lot of cats. Are you happy with where you're at in your career? Well, I think if you asked any musician that question, they'd probably say no. <laughs> yeah. And and I, you know, they would, they would have a mixed response. So everyone's trying to, you know, get to that next level. They all, Everyone has something that's like, you know, they're on a mission. And so... I'm no different, um, but I am happy with, you know, I've gotten to do a lot of great things and feel very thankful um, to know so many great musicians and be able to play with them and be part of this community. And, yeah, I want to do a lot more. <laughs> I think, uh, um, and that's that's what I've got planned. So this, this year, there's a lot going on, and, releasing this trio album and um, also a little later um, releasing a long form solo album and I'm doing a a series of concerts across the country, mostly solo um, over the summer. And I've been releasing tracks every month through my, um, to my email list subscribers. So they get kind of a special taste of the new things that are happening. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to bring this to a lot more people, reach a lot more people with my music. And I often hear from people who do connect with the music that it has uh, like a healing quality for them or something that's, there's something that's moved them about it. And it's really inspiring and, and makes me want to do that more and connect with more people in that way. So what was one of the first live jazz shows you ever saw that really, really moved and inspired you? The thing, the first thing that's coming to mind is all these Bobby Hutcherson concerts that I saw, especially when I was first getting into the vibraphone. Um, and that was around the turn of the century. <laughs> and, uh, Bobby was, I mean, he was on fire during that time. Um, And he, it was like, 
he could like make the instrument levitate is just so insane to watch him play and his connection with the instrument and, and his technical facility and just like his, you could really sense his voice coming through and something really deep happening. And those concerts had a huge impact on me. It just made me, I mean, it made me want to do that. I'm still figuring out, trying to figure out how to do that. And Bobby was just at such an amazing level. And uh, uh, there were there were a handful of others of younger players. Uh, I remember when I was in college, I went to uh, Wesleyan University with Steve Lehman, the alto saxophone player and composer. And I think it was even before I really decided to become a musician. I saw his senior thesis uh, concert and it blew me away and it, and it just made me feel like the immediacy of you know what what's happening in music at that time and made me want to be a part of it so that was a big influence influential cool thing to hear too what what do you like best about being a professional musician i feel grateful to be able to express what's going on with me through music and have that be built into my life. I think it, you know, it can be hard if you're if you're entrenched in other work to get to that. And so I'm really, that's probably my, it's probably the reason I do it. I, it's the thing that drives me, the creative process, you know, discovering, dig, digging down and finding what's going on with me and, and expressing it getting it on paper and then hearing a band play it the whole process every time i do it it just makes me want to do it more and it and that's that's what drives me to be uh be a musician it's not an easy so, life so, right <laughs> you know like, there has to be something that's making you want to do it and that's that's, that's the thing that's the thing that gets me going so do you love jazz why do I love jazz? Well, I think for really similar reasons, it's a jazz is all about finding that creative spark and 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 going somewhere with it in the moment, and that's I think that's what drew me to it. There's, yeah, there's such strong emotions and moods that get expressed uh, in jazz and what got me into it was wanting to be a part of that, wanting to also uh, get into it. It just draws you in when you, when you connect with it. And that thing you can't really put your, totally put your, uh, put your hands on. You can't really, there's not words for it always. There's some palpable mood that you feel when you're in the room with, and the music's being made in the moment that, uh, it's there's no other you know experience like that that's what makes me love it so everything's going to come down to this everyone has a perception of you your family your friends um your students fans but you know yourself best you're living your life who do you think you are mm. yeah i am a man <laughs> mm. a person uh i um a creative person who uses music to heal heal myself and heal others usually at the same time and um I'm a teacher I do a lot of educating and teaching and I'm a husband I'm a son. I'm a brother. I'm a meditator. <laughs> Play a lot of roles, and uh, you know, ultimately, I'm somebody who's trying to bring more peace into the world. I like it. That's perfect, man. Hey, Chris, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today, and good luck with everything. I appreciate it. 
Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for the interview. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in San Jose, New York City, and Kansas City, along with spots all over the globe giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Chris for his time, music, and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Jazz.